uh, last week. I told you that I, I was hoping I could finish things last week and make it a three-week ser- series. And then I said, well, it looks like it's be four weeks. Or, no, no, I was going to make two-week series. Three-week series was this week. That's right. I just, okay. Uh, and, 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 then, and then I only made it through one point last week. And, and uh, Brother Mike looked at my sister and said, oh, I guess we're going five weeks or four weeks now. So anyway, yeah, I, and then after I got done studying this week, we're going we're gonna to have to get some work done to, to do it. So turn to Hebrews 6 and Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to get going there. Just lay the foundation here as quick as we can. Uh, I, I understand that laying the foundation can be as tricky as anything because, uh, I, I, again, I'm a teacher. And so when you're a teacher, listen, listen here. If you ever wonder why you get such good stuff from Pastor Lisa and, and, and Pastor Mike and myself, uh, it's because if God can trust you, if you're a teacher, if you've quali- if you're, if you're got a gift as a teacher, and God can trust you with that, he'll give you secrets. You know why most of the New Testament was written by the Apostle Paul and, and a lot of how we see the new revelations of Apostle Paul? is because A, God could trust him, but B, and because he could trust him, he took him up into the heavenlies and, and, and revealed to him things that he said, it's not lawful for man to understand this. But he was, he, because he was trustworthy with the word, God could pour out all, more on him. And so that's kind of the way I am. The Holy Spirit will pour things into me when I'm teaching. Jessica said this before to me. She said, Thad, you could get up there and not have anything ready and just end up preaching an hour. Uh, and, I, and I could because I'd be faithful with whatever was, came out of me. But I don't because I believe in preparation. And, and, and uh, I think you guys are too good for me just to, just to not prepare, not to put in the time. So, uh, so we're going to get in here, Hebrews 6, verse 16. It says, For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath, the word for confirmation, is to them an end of all strife. And if you haven't gotten that, that, that revelation uh, yet in this series, uh, you need to get that a revelation that an oath is a word. This right here is the word. Therefore, we need to recognize this as the oath of God. And we don't take anything away from it. I, I, know, I know we go, the word. And, and again, we can say it very very uh, distinguished. The word. I can't even say it because I'm so used to preaching to you guys. The word. Uh, you know, it, it's the word of God, and we can say it so. Uh, you know, I don't know eloquently to to make it sound so. But it's it. It's the oath. He confirmed it with an oath. In John chapter one, he says, "The word was made flesh, dwelt among us." Everything that God is about is about the Word. That's why when I teach, when, I, when we teach on covenant relationships between interpersonal, that we need to recognize each word we speak is not just flippant words. It's not just, um, oops, you know. Uh, it, 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 you are literally, when you're dealing with covenant partners, when I talk to Jessica, um, every word I say to her, is a covenant word, is a covenant oath. So if I tell her something, all right, husbands and wives, I'm going to meddle here for a second. Uh, but if I tell Jessica I'm going to do something and I, don't, and, and I decide I don't want to do it, whether we like it or not, I'm going to simply say it like that. Because again, my job isn't to preach what I want to preach. Is to preach what accord what the Word of God says. But if I, under covenant, when I said I do to her, and we came into a covenant, that meant every word of my mouth is now covenant oaths. So if I tell her I'm going to do something, and then just for whatever reason I decide to go out and play nine holes of golf, and I forget to clean the house that I told her I'd clean by three o'clock, and no matter how super spiritual playing golf is. I, I need I need to make a covenant gesture of love and restoration because I have broken covenant. Oh no, that's not broken covenant. It certainly is. I mean, we can go. Uh, 
Remember what I just said about being a teacher? Go back to our tribes. If let's say one day, one day the, the warring tribe decides, though we're in covenant relationship with a farming tribe, we don't feel like it today. We're going to go play, we're going to go have um, a, <laughs> a chief, uh, I don't know, what is that last name? A, a, a chief running bull uh, golf outing. And we're going we're to leave you guys be to yourself. You've broken covenant. Because your job, your word was your oath. And so when God speaks something, listen. The enemy has bombarded everybody in this room's mind over the last at least year, two years, three years, four years. I have spoken over this body enough with the funerals. It's time to party. It's time to celebrate. And so don't mind me if we keep tables up and we keep having donuts and we keep having punch and we keep... We keep having cake. We might just bring cake because, hey, I don't know what we're going to celebrate today, but we're going to celebrate something today. But there's way too many of us who are beginning, oh, i got to just get to my message because my message would say this, we are getting way too easy familiar with the struggles, death, sickness, pain, what we can see. And we can begin losing sight or allowing our expectation of the Word of God to, to wane, to, to, to decrease. And again, if, if this Word, if we can't put full confidence in this Word, Doc, then what are we doing Oh, I don't have time to get into this. Go to 2 Corinthians 5. I, I just don't have time to get into this, but I just, I just, I'm stuck here right here. Do you, you mind if I just preach a little bit here? Verse 21, I believe it is. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. How many believe that scripture? How many believe our Heavenly Father, in his love for us, sent our big brother to the cross? Not just to shed his blood and die, but to take our sins. To take our sins and to remove as far as the east is from the west. So that as off as we've been in our lives, we are now made right with him and have access to heaven. All right. Now, I didn't see any of this, so I saw most of this. Some of it was just mm hmms But I, I got pretty much that everybody in this room believes that there's a heaven, there's a hell. And that Jesus came to bleed and to die on that cross and to raise again so that we could see heaven. Now, how many believe that 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 is an oath from Almighty God? All right, just one of these is fine. I'm, I'm, I'm okay with this, okay? An amen is always good. Kind of makes, makes Pastor a little more excited. Um, <laughs> uh a little preacher, 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 man. Yeah, that works too. All right. Uh, go to, um, let's just stay in the New Testament. Uh, go, go to, I think it's Second Peter 2 or First Peter 2. Somebody, someone's going to correct me. If, first? First Peter 2.24, yeah. If I, if I open my if I open the Bible, I can I can just go to one, and <laughs> if it's not in first, it's in second. First Peter two twenty four. It says, "Who his own self, Jesus, took our sins in his own body on the tree." We've just we've just said that's the oath. We we all agreed on that one. 
And then it says that we, being dead to sins, should live under righteousness. And then that same act on the tree, by whose stripes, what he did on the tree, ye were healed. Now, again, I'm not going to go to Isaiah 53, but that's where this is taken from. So now here's where we get into mistake. Is that we'll preach and we'll hear people preach 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21 and, and, and say that's an oath of God. If you were in sin and you accept him as your personal Lord and Savior, uh, you can be guaranteed. How, how many of us have ever led someone to Jesus and one of the, one of the things that you say to them is that you say, now it doesn't matter how you feel. You confessed with your mouth, you believed in your heart, and now you're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. It don't matter how you feel. But now we take that exact same type of scripture that says because of the stripes that was on his back, that he, that he took our sicknesses, he took our sickness. It says in Matthew, I believe it is, that, that he took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. He himself. He took them upon himself so that we are healed. So if we have such confidence in the oath of heaven that we haven't seen, why would we have any less confidence in this same scripture, same word, same oath that says he took your sicknesses, he bore your infirmities, he's taking them and throwing them as far as the east is from the west. That has no right on your body. By his stripes you were made healed. It is not just a suggestion. It is not just something because he had to figure out how to fill out First Peter 2. Well, I had to write a letter about something. Uh, hi, how are you? I am fine. Weather here is fine. How's the weather there? By your stripes you were healed. I don't know what to write. He was writing under the inspiration of Almighty God to say, this is God speaking to me under oath. Why would it be any less? And I'm not even going to get into 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. Same principle about finances. My point being here, beloved, is God, that's the first sentence of my text. For verily men swear by the crater, and an oath for confirmation is an end to all arguments. But you'd understand. Bob died of this disease. By his stripes we were healed. You don't understand, but 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 Susie died of this disease. I probably need to quit using that name in my illustrations now that I know of Susie. Uh, she, she died of this disease by a stripe she were healed. But 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 uh, but Mrs. Smith uh, has got this disease and it's and it's and it's destroying her by a stripe she were healed. What this is saying is that when you've got an oath. It doesn't matter how things look. The oath still is a confirmation. It is still an end to all strife. Don't let the enemy steal from you, Jessica. Don't let the enemy steal from you. Don't let him take from you because of what you've seen around you or what you felt. His oath, his word, is an end to all strife. It is an oath written in the blood of Jesus. You cut this book anywhere and it bleeds. Woo! I told you I was fired up. Should I keep on with the text? Because Where in God, verse 17, where in God more willing... Huh. Okay, those words are in that order. Wherein God willing more abundantly show unto the heirs of promise 
the immutability of his counsel, the impossibility that it could, it could be changed or differ or wrong. He show, uh, uh, confirmed it with the word, an oath, that by two immutable things, unchangeable things, it is, it is more likely for heaven and earth to pass away than for this to not come to pass. Because he sealed it with an oath, with the blood of his son, Jesus. Now I can hear some of your thoughts. But what about Bob, Susie, Mrs. Jones? What about them? Did, was the word of God not true? Now see, here's... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump ahead here. Ready? We have a, a covenant. That's what, when it's written in his blood, it's talking about a covenant. We have a covenant in blood for healing. And covenant is an intimate, intricate, and a binding relationship. Between two or more people. Uh, a marriage, just two people, not more. A church, more. The body of Christ, more. A marriage, just two. Just in case anybody was getting any ideas. I told you, honey. No, no, no. That unites their strengths in order to eliminate their weaknesses. So binding, unchangeable. Two immutable things, unchangeable things. It's a binding relationship. I think it was the beginning of last week, maybe, I dealt with the area of, how many of us have been preaching this? I feel like it's been more than three, but this is the third, but I, I don't know. It's a series, so just hang on for the ride, right? Uh, we talked about it, it is an intimate relation. God, God doesn't heal you because he wants himself to look good. See, let me, let me, let me say this to you. Is it okay if I borrow your towel, Jessica? <laughs> Sometimes we feel like um, we're looking at God going, God, you know, I got, I got sickness on my body. And you said, you have a, I said there's, we have a covenant. So you really kind of need to show up and bring that covenant to work so that, so that your covenant comes to pass. You understand that does nothing to God? Amen. You trying to guilt him over a covenant? Because this covenant's not about him. It's about you. You don't need to go to him, Jessica, and try to guilt him into anything. I'm not saying you have. I'm just picking on you. You just need to be his. You just need to recognize who you are. Ha! Because it's an intimate relationship. He's more concerned... He's the good shepherd that we shall not want. Not because he wants, he, he wants to be looked at and go, oh, look at the shepherd. He wants people to go, look at those sheep. All right, some of y'all didn't hear that one. He, <laughs> he's not the good shepherd, Doc, for people to just go around and go, oh, look at the shepherd. He wants people to go, oh, look at those sheep. Because if you look at the sheep, you'll find the shepherd. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. I want some of what Jessica Ellswick has. And I didn't say the other one. I want some of what Beulah has. Did I tell you to turn to the other place besides Hebrews so far in Ephesians? All right, I, I, we're on the definition, aren't we? Intimate, intricate binding. But see, here's, here's that point. People are just like, well, Pastor Thad, you've got, I don't understand because of Bob and Susie and Mrs. I don't know if I said Smith or Jones, but she's over there. They're suffering together, apparently. Um, so what's the deal? But see, here's the deal. Is that the healing that we have is based on covenant. And covenant is also, there's intricacies of it. And, and this morning the Holy Spirit gave me this 
explana- explanation, I guess, would be a fine word for it. To enjoy covenant privileges, which is what healing would be. It would be part of what you get. It would be part of your weakness. We're human, so part of our weakness is the sickness that, that comes on humanity. So it's weakness. So in order to get over that weakness and, and connect ourselves to his strength, we've got to come to covenant with him. So it's one of those weaknesses. So healing is a privilege. And, so, and again, we're talking about a lot of privileges, but we're just dealing with healing today. But with every covenant privilege comes covenant responsibilities. And when you find yourself on the outside of your responsibilities, you'll find yourself missing the privileges. Now, I say that not to accuse Bob, Susie, Mr. or Mrs. Jones or Mrs. Smith. I'm not accusing them of anything. I'm simply telling you what the Word of God says. My job, see, if I start trying to search for uh, answers, that I can get myself in a lot of trouble. But if I can stick just with the Word and say, in spite of what happened, Bob, Susie, Miss, Mrs., the women, women's group up there, you know, over there, whatever happened to them, that's, that's neither here nor there. The Word of God is an oath of confirmation. It is an oath of covenant. And therefore, in order to enjoy it, I have responsibilities in order to activate it in my life, to walk in in my life. To stay connected to the privileges, you must accept and walk in the responsibilities. Uh, I've, I've seen too many marriages where people want to get married because it gives them the license, the, the privileges of marriage. You know, when you get married, especially if you have kids, that, that goes a long way in your tax return. That's a privilege. Um, there's other privileges uh, of, of being married. Um, I'll just move on from there. But there's a lot of times people get into relationships and they're like, they're like you know, um, I don't, I'm going to go do what I want to do, live how I want to live, operate how I want to operate, and you better have you know, all of the things that I expect to have when I get home from it. And they're not operating the responsibilities but they're expecting the privileges. Too often, and that's what, we're, that's what we're dealing with here. I don't want to come out here and say, this is why this person, this is why this person. I'm just simply just going to show you in the scriptures why, why, why some people don't connect themselves to the covenant of healing. And last week was a very simple one that we talked about, but it, but it was dealing with the area of uh, uh, just you activate it by faith. You've got to walk by faith. Um, when... Uh, uh, when Jesse and I were uh, uh, dating, even when we were engaged, again, I, I've made this this comment. I recognized that I outkicked my coverage. I recognized that she, how pretty she was, and and, and that that other guys were interested in her. I, I recognized that. And when she'd go to school and she'd go that, um, there's this little thing inside of me going. I sure hope she didn't find anybody else today. I hope she, hope she didn't find anybody better, I, which we all know that would be impossible. But, you know, you stick with me for the sake of the story. And, I, you know, there was, the, there was, this, there was this, uh, this, little bit, this little bit inside of me that would, I would get a little bit nervous. Because, listen, I knew I'd waited 26 years for her to meet her. And I was ner- I, yeah. But I, I'm not lying to you. When she walked down the aisle, and I sang a little song to her, and we got up on that stage, and we said vows to one another. She said, "I do." I said, "I do." And we walked out of there. We signed a we signed the the contract in the eyes of the world, but we made a covenant with Almighty God and with one another. There's not been a day of my life since then that I've even worried myself about her and about me. 
ever. Because our oath was a confirmation. And therefore, I didn't come home and sit here and try to get her to... Do you promise you didn't, didn't hang out with the other men? Did you talk to other men? Did you do... I don't have to do that. I get to live like I'm in a relationship with her. I get to live and I get to expect that when I come home, she'll, she'll be there eventually from work. I don't... Are you, are you following me on this? Do you understand what I'm saying? Is that I get to live like I'm in a covenant with this wonderful, beautiful lady. And too many Christians are living like they might. Like perhaps, like maybe. And that's that quote from uh, uh, Mark Hankins said, Faith is acting like you have a covenant with Almighty God. I said, Mark Hankins, I like you, but I love that statement. That is amazing. Because that's what faith is. It's saying, look, I don't, what is my body saying to me? It's saying there's pain. Well, what does the oath say? He took my infirmities and bore my pain. So guess what? That pain that's in my body is foreign. It is breaking covenant protocol. And it's not my covenant partner's fault. I've, got, I've, just, I've just got to make sure that I come home, that I'm, that I'm with him in relationship. And the first thing we've got to make sure we activate it by faith. Let me get into number two here. <sighs> number two is, is, is a doozy. Oh, I have more to share on that, but I'm not going to. I don't have time to do more of that. Oh, but that's good, but that's okay. Yeah. Oh, don't mind me. I'm just having fun with myself here. All right. Uh, go to John 7. I want to get into something here that uh, uh, is, is going to help you. I, I believe it's going to help you significantly at why, why again, uh, why, why, why we find ourselves on the outside, why, why sometimes healing doesn't manifest, it hinders healing. Okay, I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you the, the word. It's one word, number two. First one is activated by healing. Number two is familiarity. I mean, we're going to end up with four areas where this comes into play that, 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 that hurts your ability to receive your healing. Uh, but I want to I show you scripturally how it will keep you. Uh, John 7, are you there? John chapter 7, I'm going to read in verse 3. And uh, we have we have the story here, the account of his he's with his brothers, and um, John seven, not John three, John seven three. There we go. All right. Um, and uh, you know the Jews are seeking to kill him, and there's the feast of the tabernacles, and so he's he's with his brothers, and in verse three it says, his brothers therefore said unto him. Hey, why don't you go down into Judea um, that your disciples can see all the works that you're doing? Now, if you need a little help on tone, uh, again, it's always interesting when you text people, especially if you're having arguments or a deep discussion on text, because you really don't know their tone. And they can say thanks, and, you're, and if you're ticked off at them, you're going to hear, thanks, you know. And, it, and it's like, no, I'm saying thank you. I really appreciate you know. Uh, so, but you need to recognize the tone of his brothers here. It's, they're being sarcastic. This is, they're, they're not being genuine. There's not a, gen, a piece of genuineness in them. They're being sarcastic. And so they say, so they say why, why don't you go on down to Judea? What's happening to Judea? They're wanting to kill him. Uh, go on down to Judea that your disciples can see all the stuff that you do and believe. Um, for, there, for, uh, for there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself, look what they accuse him of, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. If you, if you do these things, it show, you'll show yourself to the world. They're like, they're like you know you want to be famous. 
you know you want to you, you know you want everybody to see you and to and to know oh look Jesus he's here oh Jesus you know that's what you're after how many recognize that everything Jesus did was to show people the father everything he spoke was for people to hear the father and when that becomes your drive in life you're going to have a lot of people accusing you a lot of things of wanting to be famous. That's, that's one of the things that I, I try so hard. I, I, I want to be on Facebook. I want to be on Twitter. I want to be on, uh, on I'm burning my fingers. I want to be on Instagram. I want to be on YouTube. I want to have our own website. And I want to put a bunch of stuff on there. And listen, I, 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 I have not been. The Holy Spirit in the last year has allowed me to get a little bit more comfortable with the way I look on camera, thankfully. Um, it's not, it's, not, it's not my end result, but he's allowed me to, which I thank, thank God for. Because every, I, I, but I, all, I, all I care about, that's why if every, if every conservative goes to a different uh, uh, social media platform, I'll, I'll start that one too, but I'll stay on Facebook forever. Because it's not the, it's not the healed that need the doctor. Amen. Amen. All, I, all I want them to do is hear the good news of my, my, my daddy God. All I want them to do is understand what the Word of God says. All I want, that's all I want them to do. And so, contrary, if I'm as skinny as I ever want to be, or if I'm, if, if, I, if I'm heavier than I would like to be, I don't care. I need to be on there, and I need to let my face be seen. I need to let my voice be heard. Because there's a job that has to get done. And his brothers looked at him and said, All year you were interested in it is being famous. Why don't you go on down there and show them, go, go on down there in the thick of things where everybody's wanting to kill you and show them how good you are. In verse 5, it, it spills the beans because it says they didn't say that because they actually believed on him. And Jesus said, no, I can't, I'm, it's not, my time's not yet. I'm not going to go get killed today. It's not time. His brothers didn't believe in who he was. Why? Because they grew up. They didn't believe that, they, that he was who mom said he was. Listen, I, I'm not one to worship Mary, but if there was one person in the history of mankind that knew Jesus was who he was, it was Mary. And so, so imagine if you would, the biased looks... Yeah, Jesus and James, Jude. Let's just stick with those three. And and uh, someone got in the cookie jar and got a bunch of cookies. And Jesus is sitting there, you know, walking on the pool of water, op- splitting it down the middle. And Mary comes out and goes, James and Jude, which one of you? Well, why didn't you ask Jesus? Because he's the Messiah. <laughs> he always had that excuse. That he was the Messiah. That he was the chosen one. That he was immaculately received. That, that's not fair. <laughs> so so they, they were ticked off at him from childhood. And, and, and again, again, I, I, I jokingly said he spread. Because he didn't do his first miracle. The first public miracle was done in... Uh, in the the wedding, so Cana, Cana of Galilee, and so he didn't. He did step into into that, and so so here he is living thirty some odd, thirty thirty years, really not having done anything that they've ever seen, and yet Mama keeps saying, "But he's different. But he's the Messiah. But the angel showed up and told me who he was." And after 30 years, don't you think they were getting a little bit tired of it? Because if anybody knows you, it's your brother or sister. If anybody knows any of your shortcomings, it's your brothers and sisters. And so that's how they they were... and go to Luke 4. Let's continue on this. They were so close to the answer, but they totally missed it because of their familiarity with the answer. Go to Luke 4. 
Now, you know, we're, we're familiar with this portion of Scripture, but I want you to notice the location. Now, now again, see the picture here. From the days of the prophets through that intertestimonial period, that's those blank pages between Malachi and Matthew. Okay? They call it intertestimonial. Testimonial, testimonial, testimonial. I had it the first time. It's, it's, it's just it's time that's not recorded in the in scriptures. And then Jesus shows up in Matthew. And from, from the days of the prophets through that time, there was no open revelation. About 400 years, no open revelation. No words spoken, no prophets, no, no prophetic words, nothing like that at all. So now Jesus, Luke chapter 4, shows up in the synagogue. And in verse 16, he says, well, okay, yeah, let's, 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 I'll read it from up here, so stick, keep going, John. And he came to Nazareth. Where's he at? He's at home. He's in Nazareth. Just remember that. Where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he always went to church, folks. So, to be like Jesus, I go to church. He went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there, and there was delivered unto him a book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened it, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel of the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, the recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty that are bruised. And to preach the acceptable of the Lord. Verse 20. And he closed the book and gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of every one of them that were in that synagogue. All right, all right. Catch this. They had heard someone preach something who had something in him and on him that they had not heard in their lifetime. Now, again, uh, when I got done singing... I mean, when I, was, when I was up here leading worship and all that kind of, there's a lot of people looking at me. And then I sat down, and when I sat down, where did all your eyes go besides the donuts? To the next person that came up. Pastor Mike came up here, he stood up here, your eyes went to him. Not ever, I hope nobody was staring at me, because I was like, that's the natural progression of things. But see, here's why it happened. Is that there was a, in this synagogue, there was a place, there was a chair that was left open for the Messiah. That when the Messiah came, he would be the one to sit in that chair. So Jesus reads it, close it, goes over and sits in that chair. And everybody's looking and going, ain't nobody blinking, ain't nobody sneezing, they didn't go out for the donut or refill of coffee, he just sat in the chair because it was his. And what's that next scripture? This day. This day, this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. So the room, it's changed. Because instead of a lot of guys reading scripture and then discussing it in terms of let's just read this and then we'll, we'll discuss it or let's read because remember they'd read something from the Pentateuch and they'd read something from the, the prophets and then they, there, there would be some discussion or whatever. It said, yeah, the room is silent. And it says in verse 22, um, all bear witness and wondered, or in other words, other, other translations, they were amazed, they were astonished at the words that came out of his mouth. For the first time in their lifetime, there was electricity. There was something else besides the written word that they read. There was something different besides just hearing what happened to their ancestors. There was something alive in that room for the first time in their lifetimes. 
Their parents didn't even feel it. Their grandparents hadn't even felt it. Their great-grandparents hadn't even felt it. And all of a sudden, they're sitting in the middle of when that man read those words about the uh, about what the Spirit of the Lord is upon us to do. It filled and charged the atmosphere like nothing they'd ever felt or seen or heard. Oh, oh, they heard of their, their ancestors. They heard God, God, but this was them. They were hearing it. And they sat there in astonished awe at what was just said. And all of a sudden, in the back of the room, somebody go, Oh, isn't that Joseph's son? Crash. Isn't that little Jesus played little league? Hit a home run every time he got to bat. It's annoying. Valedictorian. No, I'm convinced he cheated. Isn't that Jesus? That charge in the room fell. Why? Because the little kid they see grew up, saw grew up. The familiarity. That's why Nazareth is called the town of unbelief. Keep your spot there and go to Mark 6, I believe it is. One. Just, just make sure you keep your place there because we're coming back there to that spot. Goodness gracious. Verse 2. Mark 6, verse 2. And again, if you read 1, he's in Nazareth. This is in Nazareth. And he says, And when the, when the Sabbath day, verse 2, And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue. Many hearing him were electrified, saying, From whence hath, he, hath uh, this man these things? What wisdom is, is uh, given to him? And even such mighty works is brought by his hands. Isn't this just the carpenter, son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joseph, and Judah, and Simon? Are, are, are not his sisters here with us? And instead of receiving what he did, he, what he said, they were offended by it. Because why? Because of the familiarity. It's little Jesus. Who does he think he is? And Jesus said, a prophet is not without honor. And that word honor is more than just saying, hey, we like you. That word honor is respecting someone's giftings and callings and who they are and who they were created to be. A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country and among his kin and among his own houses. And verse 5, and he could there do no mighty works except he laid his hands on a few people and they were healed. He couldn't do what he wanted to do. Why? Because the familiarity stopped them. Let's go back to Luke 4 because I want to, I want to proceed. I want to, uh, cause he, cause Jesus, Jesus recognizes what this is. That wasn't just a going that, you know, sometimes you've read that and, and you go, man, is that not little Jesus? He's grown up to be a wonderful Mighty man. And, and you can almost take a look like they were just identifying who he was. But then Jesus gets into a mode of correcting them. And notice what he says here. Verse 23. And he said unto them, uh, You surely say unto me this proverb, Phys- Physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard, uh, whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, we do in your country. And he said, Verily I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. Again, it's the same thing. In other words, he's identifying the fact that something stopped when that person said that. They were being exposed to the, exter- uh, to the eternal power of God, and they reduced it to the familiar and missed out on the mirac- miraculous. 
Now, I'm going to get here, I'm going to get here to a couple things because, again, some of you are going, okay, what is exactly your point here? And, again, there's four things I want to share with you, and we'll get to them here. But I, I, got, I want you to see that when, you, when familiarity raises its head, it will, steal, it will steal what God wants to do in you. Verse 25. Jesus then goes and gives two illustrations. And these are just, these grab you right here. Verse 25. But I tell you of a truth. Many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah. Of Elijah. All right. So Elijah was an Israelite prophet. And there were a ton of of widows, poor widows, widows that didn't have anything, widows that possibly starved during the, uh, during the drought. There were a lot of widows in Israel during that time when the heavens were shut up for three years and six months, when great famine was throughout the land. But to none of them was Elijah sent except to the one is Sarepta, a city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. A lot of, lot, of, lot of widows that were starving, but the one that received and responded was one that, that, that had, didn't, didn't know who Elijah was and, did, and hadn't become accustomed to how things were. And she responded to his words. Notice the next verse though. Verse 27 is it? And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha, the prophet. And none of them were clean except a Syrian general named Naaman. Because they didn't, listen, think about this. God sent Elijah to the widow. God Well, God moved on Naaman, the little girl, on Naaman to come to him. All right, Doc, let me ask ask you a question, as they say in the slang. Ask you a question. If Naaman could have come to Elisha and receive his healing for leprosy, what was stopping the other lepers in Israel from coming to Elisha. Unbelief. Familiarity. They didn't come. He was right there in the room. Right there in their nation. And they decided to keep their disease instead of going where healing was. Naaman at least said, what's going to hurt? If you tell me that Naaman was in perfect faith, I'll tell you you're wrong. He was about ready to go home without it. And his servant said, what's going to hurt you? Whatever. And he went and he did it and he got his healing. But every one of them in Israel decided to keep their disease because of familiarity. And again, that's in context there. God wanted to do things among His covenant people, but they didn't receive it, therefore they didn't receive it. They lived so close to it, but because of their lack of honor, they missed it. So how does this apply to us? What is What are you saying, Pastor Thad? Let me just give you four simple things. Well, well I really believe one of the next times I'm up here, we'll finish this. That's all I can say. Here's the familiarities that stop us short from from receiving our healing. The first familiarity, and I've talked about this so much, and I had actually forgot uh, Wednesday, your your familiarity with your own shortcomings. Yeah, Pastor, that's just going to... Getting all your business here. Nobody knows. <laughs> Nobody knows what you've done, but you, more than you. 
Have you ever gone to bed at night and said, and, and a thought came to your mind and you couldn't remember if you actually said that thing or if you just thought it? And you're like, man, I hope I just said that. I thought, hope I just thought that. I hope I didn't actually say that because I can't remember. But it, it, it so gripped you that you maybe thought you said it. There's not a person in this room that doesn't know your own shortcomings. You may out loud be going, man, I'm wonderful, I'm perfect. Inside you're thinking, man, I hope the lightning bolt doesn't strike too close because I, I, I know I deserve one right now. Nobody knows you, how, how bad you've messed up more than you. And a lot of times we can say, we, we can get so familiar with how, far, how, how, how much we've messed up that we start thinking, I don't deserve the healing. I don't, I've messed up. Why would God heal me? That's one of the things that I, beauty, I, and, I, and I had to kind of come, I just, I, that's why I had to build, piggyback on it when Pastor Elise was teaching on, on, on uh, Wednesday regarding uh, her ready to thump heads and ready to burn with rage. Get some nurses and some doctors, you know, uh, shape, shapened up. But see, a lot of times you can look at pastors because they won't tell you the shortcomings they've had. But they'll talk to you about how they stood in faith. I'll leave it at that. I was going to, leave, I was going to give an illustration, but I won't. We had a financial problem. And God told us to do this, and and uh, and so we we worked it, you know, again. And we we did this. We sowed a seed. We we went to this or whatever, and we and and we got a miracle. And everybody's going, oh, if I had that faith. They just heard the voice of God. Then they sowed that great big seed, and then they and then they uh, and they got their miracle. If I just had that faith, but every time God tells me to give throw, so, go, uh, sow a big seed, I sit there and I try to think, well, Lord, why? I, it's all I have, I, and we and I, I might share some tears, and I might get some stress, and I might have I might punch a hole in the wall a little bit, thinking I just need some, love, and I've messed up too much for it to come to pass now. But see what that pastor did as a detriment to his people is that he did a lot of those same things. God said, I want you to sow that $500,000 seed. And he said, Lord, I've sown seed. I've given before. I've done. And, and, and he's taken an hour to two hours and talked to his wife. And, and they had to hash it out. You know how husbands and wives hash They had to hash it out. They had to get that. <clears throat> and then and then after all that they finally said, "You know what? He's been faithful to us. I know I heard from him." Okay. And then they sow the seed. And too often we get so because the pastor didn't share that little part of it because he didn't want anybody looking at him like he was less. Listen, there was, a, there was a scripture that my dad shared years ago at an advance for, in the morning sessions for pastors. And it was where Paul said, I've been with you in every season. And beloved, if there's one thing as a pastor that I want to make sure I am, is that I'm with you, I'm in front of you, and I'm transparent with you in all seasons. I don't ever want to get up here and simply say, I've never messed up at all. Now, I was a good kid. I was not a rebellious. I was a good kid, and I'm saying that with my sister sitting in the room. I was a good kid. But I'm telling you what, I messed up. I wasn't, I wasn't your average PK, you know, like the PKs all you, you all know. Yeah, they're just totally oblivious. Uh, <laughs> I, no, a lot of people know PK. You know, if, you, if someone comes to you and says, oh, he's a PK, you go, oh. None of my, not my sisters or myself were that kind of PK. But that was me. I had shortcomings. I had things I messed up on. And that's the one thing I'll, always, I, I, I'll try my hardest to be. It's transparent to say, hey, I've not been perfect. But see, 
It's in the midst of that. Which brother was honored by dad? The brother, and again, this is, I know what, I, I know I shared, shared this on, on Wednesday, but I'm here today. That the brother that said, I'll go and didn't go, or the brother that said, no, I'm not going to go, and they ended up going. It was the one that didn't start out quite right, but he got right. And beloved, you don't have to stand there and tell me your shortcomings. Because I guarantee you, every one of you out there have them. And, and I don't care how good and how sweet and wonderful you look. Some of you got a good poker face going on right now. Not me, Pastor Thad. We all have those things that we're like, but I messed up here. I messed up there. I keep messing up in this area. And God's saying, man, I want you to draw closer to me. I want you to get more familiar with me than you are your shortcomings. Because your shortcomings are moving you away from my, what I have from you. And my healing power, my covenant power, my intimacy power is drawing you into a place where you'll never lack any good thing. Oh, goodness. Oh, i got to hurry a little bit. Now I've got to get through four points. Oh, can, can I? If you give me uh, just a couple minutes. Yeah, a couple minutes each. Everybody give me one minute. We'll be fine. Um, when I was a teenager, my youth pastor, Mark Boone, um, we, were in a, we were in a youth group setting. And he was talking about people who make a difference in people's lives. And he says, there's people just by little things that you do. There's a reason they're serving God. And I'm sitting there in the room going, I wished I was bolder. I wished I was bolder. I wished, I, I wished I'd made a difference in someone's life. I have this condemnation of the shortcomings all over me that, I mean, everybody in the, in the locker room knew I was, I was a PK, knew I was a Christian. They knew I was a Christian. I didn't do what they did. I wasn't invited to their parties. Everybody knew it. So it wasn't like, I was, but I wished I was the one that would just, that would make a difference in someone's life. And, he, and Mark's up, Pastor Mark's up there. He's going, he's going, I've got a perfect example in this room, but I don't know if anybody, I don't know if I have their permission to, to use it or not. And I'm thinking, man, I would just love to hear somebody that's doing something right. And just, so everybody's going, yeah, well, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. And he's like, does everybody agree? I'm, we're like, yeah, we've got to figure out who's doing something right in this room. And he said, Thad, I just sat there beating myself up just two seconds ago because I'd failed. I knew I'd failed. But what did he saw? He said, Larry wouldn't be here tonight if you hadn't kept calling him and kept trying to get him to church. And I kept thinking, Larry's my friend. That's nothing special. That's just me being his friend, wanting him to come to church, wanting him to, you know, not go to hell. That's, that's nothing special. That's just me being a friend. But what I saw as a failure, the man of God's up there going, you're an example. That floored me. But see, I was so familiar with my shortcomings that I wasn't receiving what God was wanting me to see. Here's a weird one. So you're familiar with your shortcomings. You're too familiar with Jesus. And I know that sounds weird because some of you are going, so you mean you don't, we shouldn't get too close to Jesus? No. Uh, let me give you another. Same, same youth pastor. I, I grew up in the church, and when I grew up, in the, when I say I grew up in the church, the grade school that I went to, was, to say it was walking distance from the church would even would make you think you had to almost walk a ways to get there. It was right next door to the church. the it, it The side of the school came out, and then our parking lot was right there, and then our church was right there. I mean, it was we just had to walk across the parking lot to get to the church. So when I was in school, we just walk across, and we'd be. At the church, mom, mom was a secretary, and 
Dad was always there, so we'd just go there. We'd hang around the church for a while. Um, so I was always at the church. And um, my, my youth pastor played baseball for the Philadelphia Phillies minor league system. And, uh, and so he had a bat in his office that he had used in a game. And I thought it was the coolest thing in the world. Anybody that knows me would understand. I thought it was the coolest thing in the world. So one day I said, can I, look, can I check it out? He goes, yeah, you can check it out. So I was just kind of holding it. I was thinking it was cool. And I kind of walked out. And I went out to this area in our sanctuary just outside of his office a little bit. There was a little bit extra room because we had these weird little V's and all that kind of stuff. And I was saying, I just got to this one part. And I started swinging the bat. Just swinging the bat. And he came out of his office. He says, what do you think you're doing? Who? What? He said, this is the sanctuary. You don't swing a bat in the sanctuary. I was like, oh. But see, that was where I hung out. That's where my sisters and I would play hide and seek. That's where we would get up on the stage and act like we were leading in worship and get bored after halfway through the first course. <laughs> Remember when they pull out the hymnals and you'd go, we're going to sing verses 1, verses 4, and verses 6. And then you start singing. And, you're, and so we'd get up on there and we'd go, we're going to sing verses 1, verses 4, and verses 6. And we'd get halfway through verse 1 and we're like, Let's play something else. It was, it was not as exciting as we thought it looked at, on the stage. That was where we hung out. That's where we played. And so that's where I swung a bat. But I'd gotten so familiar. And he was like, don't ever, don't ever treat the house of God like it's your playground. All that work he did back there in that little room of my shortcomings. Now, but see, there's a lot of people that get that way with Jesus. And they're like, how can a God of love send people to hell? You know what, Doc? He hasn't sent anybody to hell ever. No. Hell wasn't made for us. If you go to hell, you've chosen. And God has to sit up there as a loving father and watch his beautiful creation. Walk away from him. But see, people get that mentality, and they're like, they're like, how can you go send? No, no, see, he's, and they start getting familiar with their sin. They start saying stuff like this. How about grace? Oh, grace, you can do what you want to do because he still loves you. Of course he still loves you. But you still need to respect him to the level. You still got to honor him to that level. That he's your covenant partner. And what would... There are things that my covenant partner doesn't appreciate when I do. Let me see. That's okay. I was waiting for it, so I knew it was coming. And it's not. I can't sit there and go, but we're in covenant, so I'm going to do it anyway. When, when my dad first started teaching covenant and grace ministries to the pastors, um, at least one of them, I think one of them, maybe more of them, and everybody knows how my dad was with his hair. I know some of y'all looking at him the last couple of years where he had a kind of all little, you know, and, the, and all I ever remember my whole life was it was straight across. It looked like the bill of a baseball cap, and it was never out of place. And so these guys would come up to him, and, and, and they'd take his hair. I'm not going to do it to you, Doc. And they'd just mess up his hair and go, you're in covenant. You can't get mad at me. And my dad's going. You're not honoring covenant. If you think you're that close to Jesus that you can sin, that you can live however you want to live, and everything's going to be okay. You're, you, are not, you are not in the covenant you think you're in. But you, we get so familiar that, oh, sure he will. Oh, I, it's, just, it's just song service. I'm going to miss song service and I'm going to get there for the preaching because it's just song service. No, 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 no. We are literally going through the gates of praise into His sanctuary. We're standing face to face. He is in our presence. 
And he doesn't show up. So Jesus never went any place and just said, hey, y'all, just here to hang out, just, just, just chilling. When he showed up, something happened. All right, I've, got to, I've, I've used all that borrowed time. Uh, let's see. Uh, new doctrines based on the buddy-buddy kind of God. Um, maybe you're too familiar with doctrines. We'll insert that in the same way. All right. Let me, let me hit two more points. And I'll just do it as quick as I can. <laughs> that you're too familiar with sickness, number three. Um, and again, I think this one, I've talked about this, so I don't have to get that much into it. Um, uh, but but we, we get so familiar with sickness going a certain way, certain pattern, and it's, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to get us eventually, right? And so we get so familiar with sickness. And again, I, the first week I said we, our mentality becomes, I sure hope it doesn't happen to me. I sure hope that doesn't. I don't have to fight that battle because we're so familiar with how it's turned out. And that's a dangerous place to be. But the fourth area, and I'll just and we'll leave it at this, is that you get you get, and this is kind of how a lot of the scriptures work, is the familiarity you have with people to where you think there's nothing they can give me. You don't honor them to honor their gifts, so you you're too familiar with the people and their gifts. I'm I'm not going to get into very much of this. I I, I don't know if I can. A great illustration of this, Bill Johnson was talking about um, how he, he had been a pastor for several years. And he said, my wife and I always gave. We gave. We, that's not an issue. Uh, but he said, we were never, we lived paycheck to paycheck. It's just that a section of our paycheck was always given away. We just always gave. But we never were living in abundance. And he said, one day I was up on, on the stage, and, and there was a couple in our church that seemed like everything they put their hand to prospered. They weren't, they weren't in ministry. They weren't teaching. They weren't doing anything in the church other than coming and supporting the church. Everything they touched. And, and, and he said this, this thing hit me inside. said, go have them pray for you. But they're not preachers. They're not Kenneth Copeland. They're not, they're not Jerry Savelle. They're not, they don't have the big name. What could they possibly do? Apparently, they're, apparently they got a gift. And so, so him after church, him and his wife went down and stood there and said, "Will you guys pray for us? Because we need we need financial breakthrough in our lives." And the, the funny thing, he said, the couple didn't even like flinch. The man said a prayer, and he said it was nothing. It was nothing spectacular about it. Lord bless them, help them in their finances, something simple. But he said, from that moment on, things began exploding in our finances. And he said, today, we don't worry about finances. And I can take it back to that one point. Just a man and his wife in a sanctuary that the pastor came up to them and said, will you pray for me? Let me ask you a question. And this, I mean this very, I mean this very seriously. What would you do if you had pain in your body? And don't over-spiritualize it. It was past of that. I would do it in a second. What if you did if you had pain in your body and God said, I want you to go ask Reese to pray for you? What a cute little fella. I love Reese. We, I love all the kids. I, 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 told, uh, I think I told Pastor Lisa the other day is that Reese and I have always been buds. And uh, it's so much so, so much so, that I've missed out on the subsequent kids in our church because the women of the church won't let me get close to them <laughs> when they're little. And uh, because Reese and I, uh, I think Reese is probably the only baby that reached for me when he was with his mom. So, you know, I was like, hey, I must be the cat's meow. But I told, I told Pastor Elisa, I said, Reese was the tithe. The tithe always goes to the church first, and then the rest are blessed. So Reese was, so the rest of them are blessed. So I'm, just, I'm just kidding. But what, what, if, what, if, what if God said, you got pain in your leg? Go ahead. I'm not telling anybody this is what he's saying. Go ahead, Reese, lay hands on you and say a prayer. 
He's dead, probably dead. I don't even know if he knows how to pray. I don't know if he knows how to touch heaven. I don't, that doesn't matter. If God told you that's where your healing lies, go get it. Don't get so familiar with the people around you that you're missing their gifts and their anointings that are on their lives. Because one of them may be the one that loosens some things in your life. Jessica, come again. I'm going to have mercy on you for a second. Let her play. And I'm going to have mercy on you for a second. I'm going to have you stand up in a second. Has anybody, don't raise your hand, has anybody in a marriage covenant in this room ever got too familiar with your marriage and took some, started taking some things for granted? You didn't really respect the value of what you had near you. I think we've all been there and done that at some time. What would happen in your marriage if you uh, if you started valuing and complimenting and honoring those things that your spouse does instead of nitpicking on it? I'm talking to both male and female here. Instead of nitpicking on the things that they mess up on. Now, again, that's, that's extra, but that, sh- that shows you why a lot of people are missing out on healing. It's because there's things that they're getting too familiar with, too familiar with sickness, too familiar with how you've already messed up. Why, why, how would God do? God's already ahead of you. He's already prepared for your healing. He's already prepared for your provision. The only thing that's keeping you from it is you being in position. If someone missed this morning's message and said, Pastor Thad's never given me donuts, never never given me a pastry, a cherry Danish, wasn't because it wasn't there. Is your position. You didn't come. Let's stand together. Um... There's a, there's a song, and I'm not, I don't, I'm not going to do the whole thing of it. It's a new song by Brandon Lake. And uh, I just thought, that's, I need to close with that. And um, told the band, get ready, because when we learn the whole thing, it's going to be, it goes somewhere. It's in there. But what I want us to do in this place here this morning is that I am well aware that Pastor Thad preached long. But we also need to be well aware that we started 15 minutes late because we were celebrating Pastor Elisa. So I'm only five minutes long. Just threw everything on top of her. But I don't want us to leave this place without giving the Holy Spirit that chance to just rest on us. You've got pain in your body. He's a wonder-working God. If you've got something, maybe it's not pain, but maybe it's got a name. Maybe it's a disease. He's a wonder-working God. He's already provided healing. The table, he said, I prepared a table for you in the presence of your enemies. The only thing keeping you from eating at that table is location, location, location. Draw in. So what I want you to do tonight, if you've got pain, you've got anything going on in your body, I want you just to come into Him. Just offer it up. Just get lost in Him. We'll have the words up here. If you want to try to sing it with me, that's cool. If you don't, you can listen to the words. But I want us to get lost in Him for a few minutes here before we leave. I live stories that you proved your faithfulness. I've seen miracles my mind can comprehend. 
There is beauty in what I can't understand. Jesus, it's you. Jesus, it's you. Lord, my expectation is on full alert. We've been through fire. We've been through water. But my expectation isn't on the fire and isn't on the water. But it's at that wealthy place. That place of provision. That place of more than enough. That place of healing. That place of manifestation. That place of of, of restoration. That place of renewal. That place of refreshing. We have never seen, eye has not seen, nor ear has heard, nor has entered into the heart of man the ground that we have just stepped into. You've dreamed big, you've thought big, and it ain't big enough. I've given you a glimpse just to get your saliva glands running. But get ready. Whoo, it's a wonder working God. And guess what, beloved? We've got a covenant on it. Yeah, we've got a covenant on it. <laughs> oh, thank you, Jesus. Is it okay that we had church in a little bit this morning? <laughs> Hallelujah.